ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 54th public lecture series of the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus. My name is Athanasios Vionis. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Cyprus and Director of the Archaeological Research Unit. And it is a great pleasure to introduce this semester's public lecture series to all our online attendants. Uh, this is the first time that our scheduled series of public uh, lectures, our established series of public lectures, open to the archaeological community and the public and running on Monday every teaching semester without break since 1993, will be held by a Zoom and only virtually this semester, conforming to the new reality imposed by COVID-19 worldwide. Our aim is, is to continue engaging with the public and the archaeological community in Cyprus and abroad by hosting lectures on past and ongoing archaeological, cultural, cultural heritage and ethnographic anthropological research in Cyprus, the Mediterranean and other parts of Europe. More information about this and previous public lecture series you can find on the Archaeological Research Unit's website. The program of this semester series is divided into three thematic units. The first, titled Archaeology in Cyprus, includes four presentations on ongoing archaeological field research in Cyprus, discussing new findings in the region of Agios Ozomenos in the district of Nicosia, at the ancient Agora of Neapaphos, at Bronze Age Kison Ergaskalia, and at ancient Marion and Arsinoi. The three lectures of the second unit, titled From the Past to the Present, Take us to the Chasnola collections on the birth of archaeology, to the Christian ritual of the Epitaphios from the Byzantine era to Easter 2020, and the potential initiation of a new popular cult due to the pandemic, and finally to aspects of Cretomania and the decommodification of my known material and visual culture today. The three lectures of the last thematic unit, titled Archaeology in the Aegean, provide a journey to material culture production and consumption in Middle uh, Bronze Age theater and the Aegean, to the introduction of the wheel and the development of ceramic technology in the Early Bronze Age, and finally to the textile producing communities of the Aegean in the fourth to third millennia. As was the case before we switched to Zoom, some of this semester's live and virtual public lectures will be recorded and uploaded onto the Archaeological Research Unit's YouTube channel provided that our speakers have granted us the permission to do so. Thus, those unable to attend our live broadcasting can watch some of our recorded lectures at their convenience. I should underline here that since some of our online lectures may be recorded, those of you, those of you who may wish to retain your privacy can keep your cameras off during the recording. The recording will be terminated after the end of the presentation by our speaker and before the opening of the discussion session. Uh, you are also informed that your microphones are currently muted to avoid potential background noise during the lecture. Should you wish to address a question or comment to our speaker, please feel free to chat to, to use the chat function on Zoom. After the presentation, I will be reading out as many of the questions to our speaker as possible. In case you're not able to type your question on the chat area, uh, you may have the chance to address a question directly to our speaker during the discussion session and after we enable you to unmute your microphones. Finally, it is a great pleasure and honor to also welcome our tonight's distinguished speaker and valued collaborator from the Cyprus Department of Antiquities, Dr. Despina Pilidis, who accepted my invitation to open this semester's public lecture series and inaugurate this new means of approaching our archaeological and other audience in Cyprus and abroad. Dr. Pilidis studied archaeology at University College London. Her doctoral dissertation at the Institute of Archaeology was on the handmade burnished wares of the late Bronze Age in Cyprus. She joined the Cyprus Department of Antiquities in 1995, and she is currently curator of antiquities, having served as acting director of the department in 2012-2013. From 1996 to 2010, she excavated a multi-period site on the hill of Agios Georgios in Nicosia, an extensive settlement that provided documentation for various periods of the city's history. Having, having secured funding, she established a site educational visitor center at the hill of Agios Georgios, while works continue so that the site eventually becomes available, accessible to the public. Dr. Pilidis also conducted excavations at the Podokatar Bastion on the Venetian walls of Nicosia. As of 2012, she has undertaken a new project in the heart of the island, 
involving survey, the use of new technologies and problem-oriented excavations in the region of Agios Ozomenos to investigate socioeconomic organization in late Bronze Age Cyprus and to promote the protection of these sites in a rapidly developing industrial region of the island. Dr. Pilidis has benefited from a number of fellowships and external funding for her research projects. She has acted as an external examiner for various PhD theses at academic institutions abroad, such as La Trobe University and the University of Queensland in Australia and Freya Universiteit in Brussels. She has been a member of the editorial board of the archaeological series Studies in Mediterranean Archaeology for many years, while in 2010 she, also, she was elected fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. She was president of the Ecomos National, Cyprus National Committee, a founding member of the president and president of the National Committee for the Fight Against Illicit Trafficking of, of Cultural Objects, and participating expert in the UNESCO Committee and the European Union, and president of the Association of Cypriot Archaeologists between 2009 and 2018. Currently, she is president of the ICOM National Committee and president of the Committee on the Export of Cultural Goods. As curator of antiquities responsible for museums, she has been promoting the renovation of museums, the creation of new ones, and the organization of periodical exhibitions. A major part of her work involves the digitization of collections, sites and monuments through several EU and other co-funded projects. She is also responsible for the protection of underwater archaeology and is currently promoting the establishment of a specialized unit through external and governmental funding while coordinating research projects funded by the Cyprus Research and Innovation Foundation and other European funding bodies. Dr. Pelidis has organized and has participated in a large number of international and national conferences and exhibitions and has delivered public lectures in Cyprus and abroad. She has published four monographs, has edited several volumes and has contributed numerous articles in archaeological journals and conference proceedings. Her tonight's lecture is titled Inland Cyprus in the Late Bronze Age, Survey and Excavations in the Region of Agios Ozomenos. Dr. Pelidis, thank you and welcome to the unit's lecture series. Thank you very much for the invitation to open this series of lectures, albeit in a rather unusual and uh, I might say um, unprecedented way, uh, as I am sitting now in the lecture room facing uh, empty chairs. Nevertheless, it is a pleasure for me to be here and thank you for attending this lecture. Evident, if one looks at the long history of research in the area of Agios Sozomenos, that the role of central Cyprus was always recognized, but other than a long line of surveys, excavation in the area was not undertaken. From as early as 1894, Onifal Richter excavated late Bronze Age tombs at Agios Sozomenos Nicolides for the Prussian Secretary of State of Public Instruction and used the finds from these tombs to compare with exhibits in the Cyprus Museum in the catalogue of the Cyprus Museum, which he compiled with John Myers. Similar activities in the area were also undertaken prior to him in 1882 by George Colon Colonna Cercalti at a site north of Dali, referred to as Agios Nicolaos. In 1957, Hector Cutling and Giriakos Nicolaou of the Department of Antiquities initiated a survey of the Yalyas River Valley and recorded around 150 sites, most of them unknown. The majority of sites and accompanying cemeteries were dated from the Middle Cypriot III to around 1200 BC. The most important site was considered to be at the locality Ambella, located one kilometer northeast of the abandoned village of Agios Sozomenos, between the junctions of the Alicos and Yalyas rivers. The initial survey indicated that the site spread over an area of 27,500 square meters. 
It was associated with three cemeteries and considered to have played a major role in the redistribution of imported goods inland from coastal centers. Thus, Ayososomenos was already regarded as an intermediary in the handling of semi-processed copper ore on its way to industrial sites for final refining. The landscape was undoubtedly a determining factor in the pattern of settlement in the Yalyas Valley. The Yalyas River linked the successive eastern coastal ports, Calopsida first and then Encomi, with the inland settlements in the region of Ayos Sosomenos and later Salamis with Italian. The proximity to the copper mines and the characteristic topography of the river valley in which Ayos Sosomenos is located, alluvial valley floors overlooked by plateau, were also important factors for the development of the region. On top of each of the three plateaux, three forts were identified at Dali Kafkalya, Barsak, and Nicolides. They were regarded as a chain of fortifications that guarded the route of the copper ore towards the sea and considered to be under the control of the most powerful city, Enkomi. It was, however, obvious over the years that there were, there were problems with the clear identification, chronology, and character of sites located in these surveys. Thus, a new project was initiated in 2012 to resurvey and remap the settlements in the area of Agios Sosomenos. The aim was, on a first level, to amend the problem of conflicting toponyms, coordinates, resulting chronologies, and assumed functions, and on a second level, to enhance our understanding of the role and function of the area in this very crucial and formative period of the island's history through the use of geographical systems and, most importantly, problem-oriented excavations. The survey was conducted in collaboration with Eilish Monahan, a doctoral student at Cornell University. In order to relocate sites known from previous surveys, cadastral fields were selected based on the results of the archival research. Of the 27 previously identified Bronze Age sites in the study region, 16 were successfully relocated. Of these, 11 were subsequently revisited, including the three fortresses, for more intensive survey. Of the 11 sites that were not located, it is assumed that at least five have been destroyed by mining or other modern development activities. In addition to the previously recorded sites, an additional 64 cadastral fields were surveyed, particularly in the south and east of the survey region, and two new sites were identified through this activity. Five large areas were selected for intensive systematic survey, amongst them the site of Ampelia. The intensive survey at Ampelia encompassed an area that previous surveys recorded as four or more separate sites. However, in spite of the improved data provided by the survey, which have furthered our understanding of the diachronic development of Bronze Age settlement in the Ayososomenos region, it is only through excavation that the real picture has emerged. In 2013, High-resolution images of the standing architecture at Barsac, an enclosure me measuring 230 by 230 meters, were recorded using a total station. Differential GPS was used to record control points and to incorporate the data into a GIS. The modern military use has caused disruption, but it also corroborates the historic and contiguous the strategic value of the fortress's commanding location in the landscape. At the same time, the shirts collected at Barsac, Nicolides, and Kafkalia by the Cyprus survey were studied and additional surface collections were made. It was clear that despite severe erosion and mili military damage, these sites are significantly more complex than previously assumed and required further investigation. At the Barsac Plateau, only the perimeter wall was visible on the surface, but satellite and aerial photography showed soil drainage patterns that may indicate the presence of an additional wall or ditch. 
Excavations were thus undertaken in 2015 and 16. The deposits on the rocky plateau are shallow, but large areas of stone collapse indicate that the walls would have been standing at some height. A trench was sunk on the eastern side of the plateau, overlooking the excavation at Girpulos, which revealed a wall at least two meters thick, made of large boulders on its interior and exterior surfaces with packed rubble in between, preserved for about four courses and at, at about 50 centimeters in height. Another trench on the opposite side of the plateau on the northwest again revealed the line of the enclosure wall. Excavations at Barsac continued in 2016, aiming at the investigation of particular questions such as, was there indeed a double wall as it was implicated in the aerial photographs? Were there internal subdivisions? And in addition, when was the fort abandoned? Another brief geophys geophysical survey was carried out by the Cornell University team and the first trenches of five by two meters were selected to test for internal subdivisions, but no architecture was revealed, either because they were plowed away or because they did not exist. Another trench perpendicular to the wall did not succeed in locating casemates except for a huge scatter of stones from the wall itself. Excavation continued with four more trenches to the north of the interior wall to investigate the possible presence of a parallel wall. It was observed that in these trenches, the bed was covered with plaster as if it was used as a floor. Indeed, an exterior wall was found, its construction differing from that of the interior wall in that the natural bedrock was utilized to place large stones lined with mortar to form an equally substantial wall. On the exterior of this outer wall, a deep trench was cut into the bedrock, forming a huge ditch, the depth, the depth of which was not reached. Further trenches were excavated on the opposite side of the enclosure, the southeast part of the plateau, to establish whether the exterior wall was present on other sides of the enclosure as well, and not only on the northwest side, which seems to have been uh, the most easily accessible part of uh, the plateau. At a distance of about 15 meters from the interior wall, the exterior wall was traced, and here also the bedrock was cut to form a very deep ditch. The 2016 excavations at Basak have added considerably to our knowledge on the nature of this structure. It was a massive fortification that must have needed sound organization for its construction, consisting of an interior wall of about two meters thick, an equally thick exterior wall, and a ditch outside the exterior wall. It must have been quite visible while it surveyed the entire area in all directions. The ceramics are limited in quantities and are very, very worn. They belong mostly to small vessels, and there seems to be an absence of pithoi, in contrast to jihulos at the foot of the plateau, where pithoi are particularly common. The ceramics included some white paint painted and red polished foil, especially bowls with pa pa sorry, pie crust ornament, and storage jars decorated with an incised band on the neck, as well as a small figurine of a tia, possibly from a ceremonial vessel, and stone beads with incised decoration, very similar to those uh, to the ones found at Jirpulos. It seems, therefore, that Barsak was a robust structure that had nothing to do with production and storage, and was only there for a short period of time, only partly overlapping with the settlement at Jirpulos. Nicolides, the GIS surveys and targeted excavations aimed at investigating the plan of the structure, its chronological span, and hopefully its function. A small excavation in 2015 on the northeast side, at the point of the disturbance caused by a military trench, revealed an impressive wall made of rows of horizontally placed ashlars with small stones and mortar in between, preserved up to 1.2 meters in height. The wall, and at 90 degrees and seemed to be the south wall of a tower. Further excavation revealed the plan of what indeed was a tower, 15 by 7.5 meters. The circuit wall is very well preserved and encircles the top of the plateau, 
except at one point where sadly it was cut off with bulldozer to make a new access road for the military. It is made of rectangular stones placed in layers on the two faces and filled in with rubble, measuring at least 3.2 meters in width. A short initial trial excavation revealed a wall on the interior of the circuit wall under a thick deposit of a sandy field with no finds. It is noteworthy that in general, there was a dearth of objects in the excavation at Nicolides, except for very small and fragmentary, mostly undiagnostic shares. In 2018, the large building stones, some of them worked, which were redeposited to the east of the tower and hampered our work, were removed by mechanical means and retained so as to be utilized for the study of the volume of the stone material used for the construction of the fortifications. The aim was to establish the way that the circuit wall joined the tower. Below this debris, a soft sandy fill was removed to reveal the plaster floor made directly on bedrock. The plaster floor was only partly preserved and at parts it seems to have been laid on top of a pebbly reddish substratum. No finds were recovered except for small and diagnostic shirts and a crushed planeware vessel in the sandy field that covered the entire architectural remains. A cavity in the bedrock its purpose unknown, was excavated close to the circuit wall with shirts from an amphora, possibly an imitation of a Canadian amphora of the 4th, early 3rd century BC, found inside, that appeared rather puzzling at the time. The circuit wall was revealed for some distance, running parallel to the ashlar wall of the tower. The outer surface of the circuit wall was also dressed with rectangular ashlar stones, perhaps to be in uniformity with the tower. Excavation continued on the line of the circuit wall to trace its outline and see how it joined with the tower. Huge destruction was caused by bulldozing in modern times as, as the cavities in the stone uh, rubble have shown that required laborious removal of the shifted ashlars and stones until a staircase of large ashlars was revealed le leading from the interior of the fort onto the tower and smaller sized ashlars were placed on the east, east side of the staircase to form a floor surface, evidently giving access to the tower, both by the use of a staircase and a flat platform. In 2019, attention focused on the access leading to the tower to investigate, it, to investigate whether the staircase of Ashler stones and the platform of Ashler's were preserved further to the south. They were not preserved any further, but it was clear that the steps led to the top of the tower and were supported by a substructure of rubble. On the east side, the plaster floor made above bedrock was traced. A channel running slope from east to west was made in the floor, its sides smoothed and bridged at two points with flat stones. Another two channels, possibly for water drainage, were also traced running parallel to this one on the north and south. On the west side of the area, a cavity, roughly left rectangular, with a square ashlar stone in the middle was revealed, and close to it on the south, a circular hearth was found lined with clay and heavily burnt. It was already clear that the fortress was reconstructed at some point to add the formidable tower onto the circuit wall. But when did that happen? And how did the wall join the tower on the east side? Unfortunately, in this exact spot, a large crevice was bulldozed out, causing a serious disturbance that it did not allow us to determine these issues. With only small fragments of ceramics in very small quantities, mainly from small vessels, and one bronze object found on the surface after the winter rains outside the excavated area, it was proving difficult to get answers to these questions. This year, however, unexpectedly, it was possible for the first time to focus exclusively on the Nicolides Plateau, as due to the coronavirus pandemic, no shooting exercises were scheduled by the National Guard. As a result, major questions regarding the nature and chronology of the fortification were investigated and the excavation was completed. We extended the trenches to the south of the tower in what may be considered as the interior of the walled area, but no further architecture was located. 
The tower was revealed on the remaining three sides, north, south, and west, as the, the south side joining already revealed in previous excavation seasons. It was constructed directly on bedrock of rectangular slabs placed horizontally on top of a lower course of large unworked stones. The outer face was dressed, uh, dressed with rectangular ashlars and carefully worked cornerstones. Many of the ashlars are missing, indicating stone looting over the ages. Further investigation on the northeast side clarified the nature of the circuit wall and the construction method, as well as its relation to the wall of irregular stones running parallel to the interior of the circuit wall. This wall fell into disuse and its stones were reused to build the circuit wall connected to the tower. The space between this wall and the exterior circuit wall, the later phase, was filled in with a thick layer of almost completely sterile sandy fill, obviously homogeneous and most probably the result of a single action. The old wall was demolished at one point where a foundation deposit between the old and the new phase of the wall uh, it, sorry, where a foundation deposit between the two walls was found, enclosed within upstanding stones, secured between the old and the new face of the wall. In the same sandy field, five intact, intact vessels were found. A red slip laginos, a skiffos with raised handles, a small bowl with incurving rim, and two Megarian bowls with impressed decoration, all of Hellenistic date. It was thus obvious that the old wall was demolished and a new wall and tower was built in, in its place in the Hellenistic period, an entirely new piece of information that revokes what was hitherto believed, namely that the Ashla Tower dated to the late Bronze Age on the basis of surface finds. Further excavation revealed the floor made of a layer of plaster and a substratum of gravel below, directly above natural bedrock. Also, the extension of the parallel channels was found made in the floor just above bedrock, possibly for drainage or water or collection of rainwater in the depression noted a little further to the west. Excavation on the east side of the plateau revealed walls forming large irregularly shaped rooms adjoining a wall running along the escarpment of the plateau, possibly with corridors in between them. Most of the exterior wall, which seems to have been constructed in the same way as that on the north side of the plateau, was eroded. Further confirmation for the chronology of this wall and the rooms adjoining was provided by the stratigraphic sequence of the wall remains. One of the dividing walls of, of uh, one of the rooms, north wall of, the north wall of room six, is actually constructed on top of the older circuit wall, which is only partially preserved at this very steep slope of the plateau. At the same time, large slabs, obviously belonging to the old fortifications, were reused as entrances or cornerstones for these rooms. Indeed, on the east side of the outline of the old wall, the, on the east side of the outline, uh, on the east side, the outline of the old wall was traceable, as large upstanding stones are preserved in situ, reaching a height of 0.7 to 1 meters uh, high, a height of 0.7 to 1 meters, and width of 1 to 1.4 meters, in a line resembling the Cyclopean type of wall known from late Bronze Age sites, such as Encomi, Mapaleocastro, etc. It is likely that large parts, parts of it may have eroded on the downslope of the plateau. In addition, at a small distance on the side on the downslope of the plateau, a looted tomb was uh, located, carved in the bedrock, its interior already used in modern times for the construction of, the, of, the plat of a platform of cement. Access to the interior was through a small staircase of three steps on the northwest side, and a small niche was preserved on the south side of the tomb. The cleaning of the interior of the tomb did not yield any finds, and the date of the tomb remains unknown. The new unexpected result of this year's excavation season adds an important new element to the history of the fortification in the plateau of Nicolides. 
The Ashlar Wall, considered to be of late Bronze Age date on the basis of surveys made in the past, does not belong to the Bronze Age but to the Hellenistic period. The late Bronze Age wall is of a completely different construction and is not preserved on the north side of the plateau as it was replaced by the new defenses. This opens a new chapter concerning the largely unknown history of defensive or military architecture in inland Cyprus in the Hellenistic period. It is not surprising, of course, that such a location would have been chosen as the plateau oversees the entire surrounding area and the accesses to the sea, both towards the east and the south. And if the resources of the copper bearing areas on the Trodos foothills were the object of the sought after protection, there is no better place to ensure supervision than the plateau at Nicolides. Thus, many centuries later, the old late Bronze Age wall, which was probably constructed for largely the same reasons, was to a large extent demolished, its stones reused to, to build a new wall for the new regime, following the conquest of Cyprus by the successors of Alexander and the abolition of the city kingdoms, including neighboring Italia. On completion of the excavations, documentation and drawn photographs, the site was partly backfilled as a first measure for the protection of the archaeological site. Excavation at the foot of the fort, of the fort at Barsak on the east side, following a brief physical survey, revealed an extensive building in a northwest southeast direction with different rooms. It was quite well constructed with a sturdy wall facing east towards the valley with two faces in its lifespan. The foundations and lower part of the walls were stone built, the upper part of the walls made of mud brick and the roofs made of plaster. And in at least one room, the floor was made of a fine gypsum plaster, in this case with a depression at the eastern end, possibly for a pitos. The main room was entered into through a well-made large ashlar threshold with carved recesses for the support of a wooden door. Close to, a northern, to the northern wall, a hearth was revealed with an outline of stones and a working surface close to it made of large flat stones, possibly also uh, reused in the later phase. On the southeast part of the room, an oval clay basin sunk in the floor and the stone grinder on one side were found. On the eastern side of this basin, another ceramic basin uh, with a formed spout uh, was found in situ and charcoal close to it. A gaming stone close to the um, was close to the basin was possibly in reuse. A working surface made of large flat rectangular stones supported by a bench-like stone structure may have been serving both basins. Further to these, there was a double hearth with an outline made of mud close to an irregular drain or channel. The rim and sheds with parallel uh, relief ridges from large pitos vessels were strewn all over the floor. Fragmentary stone tools, the rubber and axes were found on the eastern part. On the eastern side of the central room, a short wall divided this area into another interior space. Very close to the white wall on the east side, a rectangular ceramic lecani was found broken in situ. Further excavation close by revealed a, bro Hello? a broken canonite jar and a wishbone handle. Uh, was just come in, Lucy? Yeah. From Leo. A canonite jar and a wishbone handle, possibly from a monochrome Leo. vessel, as well as a fragment of jasper, uh, plain white ware, cooking wash, ware sheds, and pitos fragments with parallel re relief ridges. Excavation below the level of the lecani revealed a cistern lined with stone slabs and pito shirts lying on top of the tile floor. On the southern side, there is a low wall made of stones and grinders in reuse. An upturned bowl in monochrome ware was found on the floor of the cistern. A stirrup jar handle, possibly of late minor 3 b date with an incised podmark was also found in this area. On the south side, a pebbled courtyard was noted close to the edge of the riverbed, as well as a hearth with thick deposits of ashes, which was partly eroded into the riverbed, into the riverbank. Further excavation in the main room revealed older walls below a hard, compact layer of earth and lime. They are different in construction, carefully built with larger stones on the outlines and the interior packed with smaller ones. 
A white slip two shirt was found on top of the earlier wall, thus providing a terminus postquam for the later phase. In the south part of the large central room, below a huge deposit of plaster, earth, mud brick, fallen stones caused perhaps perhaps by the collapse of the walls and possibly the roof, there were wall foundations constructed of large rough boulders, broken pithos and storage jars, as well as fragments of thick, mud, uh, of thick mud brick that may have formed a kind of platform. The western wall of the central room was further excavated to reveal the older part belonging to phase one. Original, originally, there seems to have been an entrance from the west into the south part of the building, which was filled in with a green clay field before it was built over. Below a heavy collapse of stones on the interior of the central room, uh, a heavy layer of burning was noted, possibly the cause of a destruction. On the south part, two small rooms were noted. In the western one, ashes, traces of burning and pieces of thick mud indicate that these may have been uh, remnants of a kiln or furnace floors. In phase two, a long corridor adjoined the large central room on its western side. It was originally divided in two by a short transverse wall. In the southern part, a pit filled in with debris was found, as well as remnants of a hearth. The corridor seems to have been laid with a wide, compact surface for the later phase, below which an earlier floor made with large stones and cobbles was found. Amongst the huge amount of collapsed stones, many stone tools were recovered, a large number of them utilized as building material in the second phase. In the southeast part of the excavated area, what seems to be an exterior wall is much wider than the dividing interior walls of the building and reaches 1.2 meters wide. Yeah, in this area, a bronze axe was found with an inscribed Cypromainon sign. Massimo Berna, who kindly examined the, uh, the object, identified sign 102 of the Cypromainon one. Further excavation in this trench revealed pitot shirts and numerous stone, gri stone grinders of various sizes. A fragmentary stone object with a vertical deep incision may have been used as a mold for the manufacture of bronze pins, also found on site. To the east of the wall, a layer of burning was recorded with some white slip two, small Mycenaean and plain wear shirts, indicative of the foundation date of this wall, which is most probably associated with the later phase of the building. Unfired and vitrified clays and some metal slag were also noted, which became more frequent as excavation continued deeper. Fragments of clay lining in situ may have originally formed part of the base of a kiln or furnace that was then covered with a layer of green, greenish clay and filled in after its disuse with waste material from the site, possibly at the time when the building was being remodeled. Further to the east, no architecture was preserved except for scattered stones that may have once belonged to walls. The southern limits of the excavated building extended into what is now the riverbed, uh, indicating that Alicos River was located further to the south than its present course. In 2015, we also extended excavation to the north part, first to test the results of the geophysical survey carried out in this area, which indicated dense architecture, and secondly, to establish the extent of the building and the site itself. Only two parallel walls in a northeast to southwest direction, possibly belonging to phase two, were preserved. The structures were interrupted by a channel uh, filled with sandy soil and lined with a thick layer of gypsum plaster on its east uh, side, connected to an irregular pit. The, gyms, the gypsum lining and some fragments of medieval glazed wares indicate a medieval date and may have been connected with an irrigation system of the period. It is worthy of note that the Caterina Cornaro summer mansion at Potamia is located only a short distance to the south. In 2016, trenches uh, on the eastern side testified that the architecture was completely obliterated by the plowing. Thus, excavation continued on the basis of the geophysical survey in, the north, in a northwest direction, where the long narrow wing found in previous excavations was extended to the northwest, confirming the geophysical survey. The medieval channel continued into this trench in a similar direction, 
to the walls and disrupted parts of them. Excavation in the interior of these new rooms revealed similar findings to those of the rest of the building. Below thick layers of roof collapse and the mud brick structure of the walls, storage jars, pithoi and huts were found on the floor. In the interior of the room, one of the rooms, the floor was made of a compact mixture of plaster. On the south of the medieval channel, the floor of plaster was also preserved with a flat stone in situ, uh, possibly used as a grinding surface. A clay hearth was located, roughly circular, around which burn, uh, burned cooking ware, an upturned, uh, an upturned lecani, pithos fragments and a stone grinder were found, as well as ashes and charcoal. Most interestingly, a small copper nodule with silver plating preserved on its surface was noted in the water sieved contents of the soil sample from the hearth. The most common finds are stone tools, mainly elongated oval rubbers, a type in common use across the island throughout the Bronze Age. Many of them were found in, uh, were found in secondary use as building material. Founders made of different types of stone were found throughout the site. Fragments of stone basins occur mainly in the south part of the central room. A few sling bullets of clay were also found at different parts. Two burnishes, burnishers reinforcing the pottery production hypothesis and a small number of loom weights of truncated conical shape indicate that weaving may have been another activity of the inhabitants. Unsurprisingly, the bronze objects, the objects are limited in number and consist of bronze pins and the flat axe already mentioned above. Small scale metal smithing activities may have been carried out on site as indicated by the stone mold and the small quantities of slag. Several fragmentary wall brackets were found in the large central room and one was found on the no northwest part of the site. The majority of stone weights were found concentrated on the north part of the site. A circular clay lid, two stone beads with incised decoration and two very fragmentary terracotta figurines were found in the eastern part of the buildings of the building. Although interesting, most of the objects seem to have been discarded or in secondary use, and it may be possible that they were left behind on the abandonment of the site. On the South Sea East side, parallel. indicating destruction of a much the destruction of a much larger site possibly also incorporating the building at the hilltop of Ampelia. Excavation continued at the site of Ampelia on a small hill directly across from Tripulos at a distance of approximately 350 meters where walls were visible on the surface with huge amounts of pito shirts. As already mentioned, it is almost certain that the, the two sites belong to the same settlement. Excavation brought to light a building consisting of a large rectangular room, 11.6 by 3.3 meters, with a fine gypsum floor, plaster floor, similar to the floor found in one of the rooms at Gipulos, sorry, with an entrance to the south that led into a possible courtyard with a cobbled floor. Within the room, nine stone bases were found in, the, in their original place on the east side of the room, where large pithoi of size two or three were standing. The pithoi were found broken on the floor. On the western side, there were more stone bases with pithoi, but at least two large stones seem to have fallen from above, crushing the pithos vessels below. On the south part of the room, the plaster floor was burned, and a thick layer of ashes about six cent centimeters in depth was found. In the same area, the roof was found collapsed above the same layer of ashes. A rectangular stone with a pivot hole uh, may have supported a, port, a post or a door. In the next area to the west, another wall parallel and adjoining the west wall of the Pithos room was found, most probably a bench as a Pithos was found broken on top of it. The floor was not so well preserved, but it was obvious that the mixture of plaster covered the bedrock. 
holes, and a number of circular holes were noted. Some of them may represent tree holes, the roots causing crevices in the bedrock, but others are post holes. One of them on the northwest side contained upright diabase stones, while others lined with gypsum may have been holding storage jars in place. Traces of heavy fire were, were also noted throughout the western part of this room. The subdividing walls were destroyed in this process and only small fragments of them were preserved. It is not clear, therefore, uh, whether this was originally a larger room, which was then subdivided in the second phase into two smaller long rooms, because the fire and destruction that followed obliterated this evidence. Pithoi were found burned throughout the area, and again the collapsed walls sealed the bent layer at some points. The large pithoi in the, in the pithos room, at least 13 to a maximum of 16, of either size uh, 2 or 3, uh, must have held a considerable amount of produce. Volumetric studies, as well as analysis of the contents, will hopefully elucidate the volume and type of produce uh, stored. Wet seeding has yielded a majority of grape seeds, raisins, figs, and cereals, especially barley. Uh, on the south side of the adjacent room, the storage jars with incised and stamped creation must have contained perhaps another kind of produce and indicate activities other than bulk storage. Stone grinders, a small bronze blade, diabase tools, and a gaming stone were found. More gaming stones were found, strewn, uh, were found in reuse in the wall construction, and some were found strewn, strewn around the surface of the small hill. A stepped lime, limestone object was found in the layer of destruction. Excavation continued on the east side of the building to establish whether it extended down the slope of the hillock. The cobbled courtyard did indeed uh, extend further, possibly enclosed within, within a very disturbed uh, wall on the east side. It seems that this floor was renewed, and as in some places where this was not preserved, another quite well-preserved cobbled floor was found uh, with strewn pithos shirts on it, some decorated with wavy lines, uh, with uh, pithos with wavy lines left in situ. In some places, a thin layer of yellowish brown soil was found below the later floor. The extent of, of the floor on the south part was lost as a result of recent cultivation activities. The same activities caused the destruction of the architecture on the east side, although it seems that the building extended on this side as well. The north wall of room one was not preserved and excavation on the north side down the slope again proved uh, fruitless. On the west side, traces of a floor, lay a layer of ashes, possibly from the fire destruction, as well as strewn burned stones were found, was probably remains of a wall. Finds consist only of pithos and storage jar, jar shards. The same layer of ashes, crevices, and remains of a burnt floor of plaster were, were also noted on the southwestern part of the building. A broken pithos was found fallen or placed on top of a stone basin, which was sunk in the floor. Inside the roughly oval shaped basin, there were small shards of a white slip one bowl with a perforation, shirts from, base, from a base ring jugglet, fragments of a plane were played, and black slip shirts. A large storage jar with a horizontal incised band on the shoulder and horizontal handles was found, as well as a thumb grip handle, most probably from another pithos. A soft fill inside the basin contained a cylindrical perforated stone weight, a triangular stone weight, a clay weight with a central perforation, and a flat grinder of diabase. The bottom layer inside the basin was darker in color and was sampled in the hope that it may provide evidence for the activities conducted. On one side of the basin facing north, there was a perforation, but if that was a drain hole, there was no outlet as if it was, uh, um, as it, as it was sunk in the bedrock. A layer of packed mud around the basin was removed to reveal stones in situ that may have held the basin in place. On the south side, these were placed upright. A burnt white slip bowl, some cooking ware shirts, plain ware and bread slip were collected in this area. It is not clear whether this was part of a workshop area or, or whether it is a secondary installation with entirely different connotations. It almost seems as though old material from the site, with signs of burning, was reused and buried as a kind of ritual deposit. 
Further excavation on the west side revealed a fragment of a possible wall, but nothing else was preserved. Radiocarbon dates from the burnt floor of the building and the collapsed roof indicate a range between the middle of the 15th century to the beginning of the 12th century BC, possibly the time of the destruction by fire and the end of the habitation and, and the end of habitation in the area. The survey and excavations in the region of Ayososomenos have revealed an extensive site consisting of a storage building on the hillock at Ambella, overlooking the area with associated workshops on the lower slope at Circulos, which appear to be part of the same site. They seem to have flourished from about the 16th century to their final abandonment at the beginning of the 12th century BC, and to have been associated with a fortress immediately above the site at Barsac. As time progressed, there seems to have been an intensification of production and an increasing centralization witnessed by the centralized storage at Ambella. At Circulos, there is evidence for pottery and pithos production, weaving, and small scale metallurgical work. The lack of domestic waste in the area of the workshops may point to specialized production, supervised perhaps by an overarching local authority. At the same time, contact with the harbors is indicated by the canonite jar found in the workshops, as well as the stereotypically laid minon with a, an incised pot mark on the handle and me and where. The real extent of the contacts is, however, witnessed in the contents of Tung Chi, excavated in 1970 by Overbeck and Sweeney, which in spite of the fact that it was partially looted, an array of prestige goods such as a cylinder seal of black steatite, late helatic 3A and B vessels, a stone mace head, a similar one also found on the site of Jirpulos, an alabaster vessel, ivory objects, handles of vessels with inscribed pot marks, and important metalwork such as a bronze battle axe and belt with affinities in the Levant. A wide range of contacts within the Eastern Mediterranean is witnessed, which was already explained as the result of wealth from cultivation of the extensive arable and well-irrigated land in the area, the proximity to the copper mines and the transport routes to the sea. It may be possible that a new fort was constructed further out as the exploitation of arable land was intensified at Nicolides, very much along the architectural prototypes of Encomi. As to the reasons for the demise of this social network, they are a much discussed topic in Cypriot archaeology. If Barça coincides with phase one at Circulos, it provides evidence for an elite-dominated, largely agrarian-based system, possibly interdependent with other such centers, with access to pre prestige sea-traded goods. The monumentality of the fort itself betrays that control over human and material resources was already well established, but it must have been a response to some kind of insecurity, possibly still requiring a statement or an expression of the local elite power. Barsac was then abandoned and succeeded by another fort at a distance of about two kilometers away at Nicolides, possibly to incorporate a larger area around the settlement. At this time, an increased production is observed in the workshops at Circulos, and a highly visible building is constructed on the hillock to the northwest, which incorporates bulk storage. Thus, it seems that this system was further elaborated until the inhabitants were forced to flee, taking their possessions with them. A fire destruction followed in the Pithos house at Ampelia and to a smaller extent at Circulos that put an end and signified the collapse of this entire system. Although it may, it may be rather premature to make assumptions on possible causes, it is important to note that there has been considerable discussion on possible climatic changes over a long period of time, mainly arid conditions that may have influenced, influenced production. There have been studies, some focusing in this area, which need to be taken further. It may indeed be possible that the effects of a shortage of supplies in an agricultural uh, region and its concentration in the hands of the elite may have had a much more immediate and adverse social impact, which could have resulted in actions that are clearly visible in the archaeological horizon.
Perhaps we do not have to imagine marauders and invaders, but we may be facing evidence for the collapse of a system that was no longer sustainable as a result of a combination of factors, both social and economic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pilides, for this very rich presentation of uh, your latest findings uh, at IUS Um I, We apologize again for this interruption. It seems that 